Hello everyone, today I wanted to break down the fire scene from Asiana Flight 214 from leadership to firefighting tactics used just to get a better understanding of what happened that day. Alright, all the passengers are off the plane. They just completed a secondary search. There are no passengers left on the plane. They've already pierced the fuselage. The shooting foam inside. They're shooting water on the outside. Alright, you have to still get, I want way, you to be not here yet. Okay, okay, hold on one second. I need you to get all of our companies onto a TAC channel that works, and I believe it's C-14 that's going to work down here, correct? Yes. Okay. I want you to be on C-14 for tactical, okay? You're going to be my uh, fire attack rescue guy. I okay? need to get as much information as you can on C-14. Okay, so the camera, the camera is on Battalion Chief Mark Johnson's helmet. This is the initial meeting. Um, the fire scene has been ongoing, so there was a pass down. And the pass down had all passengers are off the plane, which is uh, good news. They completed their secondary search. Um, they have their communication and radio comms set up. And he just, the uh, incident commander just told um, Battalion Chief Mark Johnson that he is fire attack and rescue. So we're going to move on. You're not quite reaching it. Okay. There you go. I'll get to the side instead. Okay, so now we have different agencies. So the guy driving the truck, he's from an airport fire station. And the chief is probably from a different fire station. We have all these mutual aids coming together for this um, big emergency. And so with that, the driver probably only has access to his department's radio through the headset that he was wearing. So he's unable to hear the radio comms going on between the other agencies because his captain probably has, a, has the radio. Um, so what was good was the chief came and did a face-to-face -face with the driver. Um, to note, the chief was also a good spotter during this time. Usually there's more trucks, so they're able to communicate. But in this scene, at this time, there's only one. Um, and the other trucks were probably resurfacing. Because the truck that this man is driving is only, I believe it's a four, um, 3,000 gallons of water. So he only has four to eight minutes, depending. Um, it looks like it's an older uh, T3000 um, backup truck. You know what, we're going to need somebody with foam here. There's essentially two large openings, one in the middle of the fuselage and one in the front of the fuselage. 88, who's in the rear, can only kind of hit the, uh, the back hole. We need somebody in the front hole. Okay, so he's asking for resources. Um, the problems that they're running into, it seems, is that you have regular um, firefighting um, municipal engines, and they don't have the foam or turret capabilities to as to assist with these type of fires and it seems like there's no hydrants in sight um, many airports the hydrants are few and far far between um, especially closer to the runways um, so the trucks that need to go resurface their water is taking um, a lot of time hey, can you put it put it right through the door you'll hit it right through that open door Oh, because right now you're just kind of hitting the skin. Yeah, right through there. That's it. Yeah, right through there. That's it. You're almost out of water? Can I blast my pump or you? You have to go back. Okay, all right. Okay, so these turrets are ineffective. Um, they're using the roof turrets. This truck is a different truck, but it's the same old style Oshkosh. This looks like a T-1500. So it only has 1,500 gallons of water, which is two to four minutes max, and it has to resurface. So it just took all that time to go get water. It comes back, and it has two to four minutes, and then it has to leave again. So that was the problem. You don't see too many trucks around because they're dumping their water, and then they're gone to go grab more. 
but uh, we're going to hang on. Why don't we run something up the back of this plane? In the back, just start a little bit. I, don't go too deep, all right? Take the deck gun and take it off the rig and run it to the hole. Do you have to? They didn't even put through that hole. Most of We're going to run out of water. I know. I told them to get a supply to us. You guys just throw what we can until the other guys get back, all right? All right, so now they're trying to figure out what to do because these trucks are gone and you have a lot of personnel, but you don't have the right um, the right trucks. What you need is uh, they need the truck with the boom, with the high reach extendable turret so that they can get up and above the aircraft. Um, but right now they're basically going to try use um, blitz lines or master streams and try to just hold the fire down until these trucks come back. Hey, I apologize for yelling at you, all right? All right. No, no worries. You know, I'm sorry. No, 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 no. All right. So, that was right, my call because right. I saw it. that. Yeah, I, I'm still out of line. So I want to apologize. All right. No worries. Yeah, I like this part. Um, it shows that the chief is a good, he has good leadership skills. He's a very humble person. And, you know, chiefs don't have to go and apologize to anybody for the calls they make, but he felt it was necessary to to say sorry and apologize. So that that's, that was cool. We need to look through that front window. I need to look through that front window. You want to wait until they knock it down a little bit? Yeah, they're knocking it down right now. Truck over here then. All right. Can you give me a select? All right, so that's the elevated truck with the high reach extendable turret with that boom. Um, now that truck's on scene, it's a rescue nine. So you can see um, the high reach extendable turret is having an immediate impact on the fire. Um, you can see with all the white smoke before it was kind of black and nasty smoke and now it's more white. Um, so it, it is hitting, it seems like it's hitting the seat of the fire now that it can extend and get over the top. Meanwhile, these, these crews are talking about, I guess there was a missing crew when they did the accountability for all the passenger count, they're missing the crew. So these the rescue crew is going to try and make entry through these this front door here so you can see there that the um interior crews are trying to make entry and they're right here and they're sliding all over this thing this thing's covered with foam it's slippery so they're having a hard time get in and then here's a good example of um, why those other turrets was wasn't the best tool for this fire um, you can see that it's on the other side of this truck and it's spraying over the top and it's it's hard being the driver of the truck it's hard to see where exactly your agent is going so they might be thinking that they're hitting the seat of the fire but in reality they're coming over the top and they're impacting this truck's visibility meanwhile this truck with the high reach extendable turret is coming right into the seat wasting you know not wasting any agent not making any mess all on the ground but um being real accurate um with its with its uh turret okay good <laughs> Okay. Command, this is fire attack. Clear. Um, I don't know where that crew is. I know they're out amongst the other uh, injuries or what. I've searched the perimeter of the airplane. On the okay, so you can see now they, um, they've they deflated the slide and they're laddering it into the aircraft to do their search, which is I think was a good idea because once the victims or the passengers are all off of the aircraft, that's basically the only use for those slides is to get people out of the aircraft quickly. And once they're out, 
you know, now they're kind of a hindrance to firemen who are trying to get back into the aircraft to do search and rescue. So they deflated it, they laddered it, and now they can continue with their job. Okay, we'll give you that. So you have entanglement hazards that can be mitigated with a power with a saw, uh -huh. right? cutting saw. Okay. The wires that I was cutting with these. <laughs> Why don't we do this? I'm gonna get an engine company to come and take lines in there. Why don't you guys take the entanglements for me? Yeah, sure. All right, we'll do that. Hey, Okay, so now um, it seems like the fire is pretty much out. They have some hot spots and they have to go into um, salvage and overhaul. So the rescue um, team is going to go in and they're going to start clearing the entanglements to try make some room so that the engine can bring hand lines in and start really digging through all the mess. I'm sure it's, there's luggage and all kind of things, chaos inside there, but they need to clear all that make sure there's nobody else in there be 100 percent sure and make sure there's no fire that could restart up later and um here is uh, the ending part of the scene where um, i think this is an ideal situation which i would have gone for um, right off the bat i don't know if it was available these trucks were available to them initially but you could have um, maybe this another truck on the other side maybe over here you have um, elevated waterways coming down from the top and um, also you can keep these are kind of these are like the the front line first trucks um, earlier they were using the backup trucks but instead you could keep these guys parked here and then have those backup trucks run and resupply and then come back and then reservice these trucks that way you keep the first stringers um, in the game at all times but um, that's pretty much it. Um, that's kind of my take as um, what happened. I tried not to Monday morning quarterback too much. But um, yeah, it was a very interesting video to watch and learn from. Hope you guys learned something. And uh, thanks again for watching.